a complicated history in the United States. It is only through enlightenment that this scourge can be wiped out. They both smoke pot. That's jag talk for marijuana. People who push drugs must be put in jail for a minimum of 50 years. Someone caught even with a small amount can be sent to prison. President Carter today came out for an end to all federal criminal penalties for the possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. Marijuana could very well be one of the most dangerous threats to an entire generation of Americans of any drug that we know. I experimented with marijuana a time or two and I didn't like it and didn't inhale and never tried it again. Sentiment about cannabis in the U.S. is tied up in feelings about public health, race, crime, and morality. And that complicated relationship makes the rapid change in public sentiment toward decriminalizing and legalizing the drug even more surprising. Every ballot initiative involving the decriminalization or legalization of marijuana passed in the 2020 election. Voters in New Jersey, Arizona, and South Dakota chose to legalize marijuana for adult recreational use. South Dakota and Mississippi voted to legalize medical marijuana use. That means 15 states, along with the District of Columbia, have legalized marijuana for adult recreational use. And 36 states and D.C. permit medical use of the drug. Now, a third of the country lives in a state where medical marijuana is legal, with eight Republican senators representing legal cannabis states. Additionally, the Democratic-controlled House of Representatives just passed the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act or the MORE Act. The bill would legalize marijuana at the federal level and implement sweeping regulations and reforms surrounding the drug. The 2020 election and the House vote reveal something important about the shift in the marijuana debate. Marijuana may be one of the few truly bipartisan issues in the United States right now, with 91% of Americans saying it should be legal for medical use, including nearly six in 10 Americans favoring legalization for both medical and recreational use. Despite the long road marijuana has had in the U.S., legalization advocates think the government may be on its way to descheduling the drug after 50 years of it being criminalized at the federal level. Here's how the U.S. ended up with a web of contradictory marijuana policy and where the law might be headed from here. There has been a lengthy history of cannabis in the United States that has generally followed two tracks, medical and recreational. By the late 1800s, there were a wide number of medicinal uses for cannabis. People used it as a pain reliever to treat nausea and even to soothe the gums of teething babies. Its role as a recreational substance is about 100, 120 years old. When migrants fleeing the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz in Mexico came to the U.S. and started settling along the U.S.-Mexico border. The migrants were able to recognize cannabis' use as a recreational substance, which was very different than how Americans had been using the drug. And of course, this becomes immediately an issue because it is a minority population that is currently being demonized. During this period, nearly every state west of the Mississippi River passed anti-marijuana legislation. And by 1933, about 30 states had outlawed marijuana for non-medical use. Congress passed the first federal law that addressed recreational marijuana use in 1932 called the Marijuana Tax Act. It didn't specifically outlaw cannabis. Instead, it required anyone who grew, distributed, or used marijuana to register with the federal government and pay a small tax. What essentially that allowed the federal government to do was to collect the names and identifying information of everyone who is involved in the cannabis trade, making it easier to keep an eye on them and essentially allow the government to survey their activities. In the 1940s, World War II made hemp patriotic. The military needed it to create rope and other useful materials. With the end of the war, measures to crack down on weed ramped up again, and with the counterculture of the 60s, it became a symbol of protest. When Richard Nixon entered the Oval Office in 1969, he made drug prohibition one of his main priorities, culminating in the Controlled Substances Act of 1970, which created a scheduling system for drugs. The system is based on two criteria, the drugs medicinal value and the drug's potential for abuse. Schedule 1 drugs are considered to have no medical value and high potential for abuse. The legislation gave the control of determining which schedule drugs should fall under to Nixon's Attorney General John Mitchell, rather than to a doctor such as the Surgeon General. When Nixon and Mitchell, both of whom were uh, adamantly opposed to marijuana use because they saw it tied to the counterculture, the civil rights movement, and the uprisings of the 60s, when they tried 
to put cannabis into Schedule 1, they had a hard time convincing Congress that that was where it should go. In order to reach an agreement with Congress, they said they would form a commission to study marijuana in the U.S. Nixon and Mitchell subsequently classified marijuana as a Schedule 1 drug, alongside heroin, LSD, and ecstasy, while the commission, which came to be known as the Schaefer Commission, set about studying marijuana. The report ended up contradicting that decision, determining after a two-year examination of marijuana users that the drug did not cause the concerned side effects such as a lack of motivation or increased aggression. Nixon refused to accept these findings and kept marijuana classified as a Schedule One drug. But the commission's report didn't go unnoticed. It became available to the public, and many activists took it upon themselves to work to decriminalize the drug at the state level. Between 1973 and 1978, a dozen states across the country decriminalized marijuana, essentially making possession of up to an ounce of cannabis the equivalent of a parking violation. But the decriminalization came to a crashing halt in 1978 when concerned parents began pushing back. As decriminalization spread across the country, so too did additional industries that aided in the consumption of this decriminalized drug, which was paraphernalia, magazines, movies, music. So a lot of the products were available to children, and that was the crux of the problem. In the late 90s, public sentiment surrounding marijuana use began to turn. In 1996, California became the first state to legalize cannabis for medical use. And in 2012, Colorado and Washington became the first states to legalize marijuana for adult recreational use. 15 states and DC have followed suit since then, culminating in the major wins for the pro-legalization movement in 2020. The conflict between federal and state laws posed challenges to cannabis businesses operating legally at the state level. One of the biggest issues for businesses is a lack of access to banking services as well as the inability to get loans. Anyone running a legal cannabis business according to state law is still considered a criminal at the federal level. That means banks, including state chartered ones, are at risk of federal regulators deciding that the financial institutions are violating money laundering laws. This means multi-million dollar businesses have to function largely as cash-only enterprises. A big shift for the cannabis industry came when the Justice Department in 2013 issued what is referred to as the Cole Memorandum. The memorandum provided a set of criteria for states operating recreational and medical cannabis programs, such as preventing diversion to the black market and protecting minors and other vulnerable populations from accessing cannabis products. The Department of Justice had a policy that if states could meet these standards, it would not enforce federal marijuana law in those states. In January 2018, Attorney General Jeff Sessions during President Donald Trump's administration rescinded the Cole Memorandum. After the rescission of the Cole Memorandum, every single U.S. attorney in each state actually still abided by that same criteria that was included in the Cole Memorandum because it was good policy and it made sense and it just wasn't feasible to enforce federal law in the way that anyone um, in the Trump administration had threatened to do. The criminalization of cannabis has led to a large number of people being charged and incarcerated for possession or trafficking of the drug. Pew Research Center found after analyzing data from the FBI that four in 10 U.S. drug arrests in 2018 were for marijuana offenses. A 2020 ACLU analysis of FBI crime data found that despite an increasing number of states legalizing or decriminalizing marijuana, law enforcement made at least half a million marijuana arrests in 2018 more than for any other drug. The report also found that Black Americans were nearly four times more likely than white Americans to be arrested for marijuana possession, despite the two groups using the drug at the same rates. Between 2010 and 2018, marijuana arrests in the United States trended downward slightly, but rebounded at several points. As of 2018, the national downward trend appears to have leveled off, even as the number of states that have legalized or decriminalized marijuana has increased. Maritza Perez is the National Affairs Director for the Drug Policy Alliance, a nonprofit that advocates for complete legalization of marijuana. It continues to be one of the main drivers of drug arrest, marijuana possession that is, and marijuana use. It continues to be a driver of deportations. It's a major criminal justice issue that really has lifelong consequences for people with convictions. But some have expressed concerns around legalization for recreational use. Kevin Sabet is the president and CEO of Smart Approaches to Marijuana a nonprofit organization that opposes the commercialization and non-medical legalization of marijuana. So I think there's been a false dichotomy uh, over the last 20 or 30 years that pits 
legalization against uh, incarceration or the war on drugs, as if those are the only two options we have for drug policy or for marijuana policy. And I think the reality is there are far more innovative, cost-effective, uh, interesting policies that frankly are much more in the middle uh, and don't fall into the trappings of either you know, criminalizing, especially certain groups that are disproportionately affected, uh, or on the other hand, glamorizing, normalizing, and commercializing today's very high potent marijuana uh, you know, sold by big tobacco and big alcohol and big pharma. And we all sort of know how that movie ends with those industries. Why would we want to have marijuana uh, follow the same suits? We think that in order to really have a framework around drug policy that's built in equity, you need to account for the legalization component because legalization often means that you're regulating the drug. Um, so decrim is great. It's a start. But, you know, I think full legalization is really how we get at issues um, surrounding equity. I, I personally believe we, our goal should be to discourage use, not encourage use. It's hard to discourage use if there's a pot shop on every corner and selling really nicely looking glamorous items that promise the world in terms of how they make you feel, etc. I think people need to realize that the interest that big tobacco and big alcohol have in the marijuana industry, this isn't about Cheech and Chong or mom and pop stores. This is about a major uh, industry that is being taken over by the alcohol industry and by the tobacco industry. So I just don't see how this is gonna be helpful for anybody when these big interests take over. The needle has moved enough on public opinion that the House of Representatives made the historic move toward legalizing marijuana at the federal level with the passage of the Moore Act. The Moore Act would not only remove marijuana from the list of controlled substances, but would also address criminal justice reform by allowing the expungement and resentencing of marijuana convictions. The legislation would also tax the marijuana industry in order to fund social programs that would invest resources into communities that have been most impacted by marijuana prohibition. And the tax would also provide support to underrepresented communities trying to enter the cannabis industry. Even if marijuana legalization and decriminalization seem like bipartisan issues at the ballot box, Republican and Democratic lawmakers in Washington still seem far apart on the issue. The Moore Act passed in the House along party lines, with five Republicans voting in favor of the bill and six Democrats voting against it. But to me, I don't really take that as an indicator of, you know, Republicans being against the policy itself. I think a lot of them behind closed doors will say that they think that we need to legalize marijuana. I think the problem with many Republicans in terms of the Moore Act specifically, they are reluctant to impose a 5% and then 8% tax. And then there are various aspects of the bill that they would want to amend because it provides too much regulatory oversight by the federal government. The Moore Act couldn't be passed during the regular session of Congress because it's so controversial. So it was passed during the lame duck session, but I don't really see this as having much momentum uh, going forward with the new Congress. There are still many Democrats that are uneasy with the idea of the Moore Act. And I think there are ways uh, where we can decriminalize marijuana without opening up what the Moore Act would do, which is create a new, huge for-profit industry. It was pure, unadulterated for-profit, really irresponsible and reckless full legalization of high THC products. So I don't really see it going forward uh, further than it already has. The Moore Act is not expected to be taken up by the Senate this term, but Perez still thinks the passage of the bill in the House sets a precedent for policy advocacy going forward. We knew that this would, you know, there's no way that this was going to go through the Senate this year, but that wasn't the goal. The goal was to have a marker bill where the House of Representatives had to take a vote on this issue. 